This video is sponsored by Casetify. More on that later. Hi, happy Monday. Let's try that one again. Just move a little bit to the left. Hi, happy Monday. Uh, your water's in frame. Hi, happy. I think the shirt's too tight. Hi, it's too loose. Hi, happy. Are you sure you're happy? I don't, I just don't want it to come off as disingenuous. I guess I don't know. Hi, happy Monday. Please tell me that one was good. Maybe run that one one more time. God damn Hi, happy Monday. In the new HBO Max show, The Rehearsal, Nathan Fielder seeks out ordinary people and walks them through tough conversations and monumental life events, rehearsing it dozens of times until the participant feels comfortable with moving forward with the actual confrontation. The concept seems simple enough, right? Until you realize that Nathan has taken a scan of your entire apartment and has built an exact replica on a soundstage in order to conduct a rehearsal of his own with an actor that looks just like you. Now, this show is genuinely unlike anything else I've seen on TV. TV. It's inventive, it's goofy, offbeat, and overall, I find it to be pretty genius. Nathan does this great job of creating a brilliant concept after the success of Nathan For You, and I feel like the rehearsal stands on its own as a wonderful piece of media that will be watched for a long time. Most of this video is going to be touching on the first episode of the show, so I definitely recommend watching it before you watch this, but it won't be necessary if you just want to see what I have to say and then maybe watch it later. But with that, let's continue. The rehearsal is unscripted content content falling under the same umbrella as reality TV. And obviously we know that reality TV often strays from reality. There's always this narrative or a form of lying beneath the surface, which is why I found it so interesting to see Twitter discourse around whether or not Nathan Fielder was being manipulative in these experiments. The discourse around Nathan Fielder seemed to start with this article from the New Yorker in which the author relentlessly bashes the rehearsal and in turn Nathan himself. He paints Fielder to be this manipulative mastermind and all of his contestants are just mere pawns and his elaborate plan to humiliate them on national television. Now I want to make it clear, I really like the rehearsal, and I'm a huge fan of Nathan Fielder's work as a whole. And as an enjoyer of the show and of Nathan, I think the critic is way too harsh with his analysis. He expected Nathan to answer questions in the plot of the show, such as what he promised his subjects, what was required of them, what they expected of the process, and what involvement, if any, in the ultimate broadcast product they'd have. But Honestly, this kind of critique feels so insufferable and overdone that I feel like if Nathan answered these questions in the show, then the writer would have critiqued him for giving away too much. He states that as the sole narrator of the show, Nathan Fielder is the only person in charge of the narrative, as if Fielder is the only person to ever create a docu-series. And I just feel like the writer is trying desperately hard to be pretentious and act like a divisive film bro willfully misunderstanding anything that isn't completely written out for him. And it feels like most of Twitter would agree with that sentiment, the article sparked a huge online discourse, and from what I've seen, the general consensus is that Nathan Fielder's fans don't really care whether or not he's being manipulative, and the author of the article was overreacting to something that was created with the intent of being enjoyed. And a lot of them even draw attention to the fact that people like our friend from The New Yorker don't criticize shows like The Bachelor or other reality shows in the same way. The article gives little to no autonomy to the participants who willingly signed up to be on the television show. He ignores all the choices that are available to anybody on the show, taking in a assumption that Nathan Fielder is unjustly putting people into positions they don't want to be in, when in actuality these people came to him first and signed up for the show. Now of course this opinion is through the scope of me as an audience member watching the show, and reality can be uglier than we as the audience actually perceive it. But I just feel like writing an article with this little evidence or reasoning doesn't come off as analytical or intellectual, it just comes off as biased and angry. Looking at these tweets, it doesn't actually seem like there's much of a real division over the show besides that article from the New Yorker, but what if there was? What if I were to put aside my biases and ignore the general consensus? What if I were to try to get into the mind of a stupid reporter and analyze the rehearsal as objectively as possible? Is this all a fabrication of this person's imagination? Or is Nathan Fielder actually an evil mastermind?
Now, in order to set a reasonable scope for this evaluation, let's take a look at the pilot of the rehearsal, since it's the most contained episode of the entire season. Of course, most of you are probably aware of his more popular show, Nathan For You, but with the rehearsal at the forefront of this conversation right now, I figured we could just zero in on this episode. So I'm going to watch the episode Orange Juice No Pulp and keep track of each time there is a lie or manipulation, who is affected by that manipulation, and then rate it on a scale of one to five liars, based off of how egregious the lie is. Liars being the musical instrument, not the type of person who spreads misinformation. The data will then be compiled into a spreadsheet, and then we will examine what I think are the top three most immoral lies of the show, and I'll try to get to the bottom of who's responsible for making my writer watch the pilot of the rehearsal three times. You're gonna get me to waste all my time doing that. I'm gonna hire someone else to do it. Okay, so before we start, the premise of the episode is that a man named Cor needs help coming clean to his friend Trisha about a lie he told over 10 years ago. The two friends play trivia together every single week, and Trisha has believed for the past decade that Cor has a master's degree, which is a lie he told over 10 years ago in order to gain credibility in the trivia space, I guess. What is seemingly a minute fib has been eating at Cor for years, which is where Nathan comes in. In building a perfect two-scale model of the bar where the two friends play trivia, Nathan and Cor will recreate the exact conditions of the night, rehearsing the confession over and over until it feels perfect. They even go so far as to hire an actor to play Trisha, so Cor has a realistic person to rehearse with. Every part of the interaction is meticulously rehearsed and recreated in order to prepare Cor for every possible scenario. So with that in mind, let's talk about what I think are the three most egregious lies told in this episode. So throughout the rehearsals, Nathan notices that Core becomes increasingly more unfocused if he's performing poorly at trivia. He reveals to Nathan that if he's losing the trivia round, he might not confront Trisha at all, which would render the entire rehearsal useless. Nathan easily finds a way to get the trivia answers from the host, but is faced with the challenge of getting Core to learn the answers. Core staunchly believes that cheating at trivia is one of the worst things someone can do. So Nathan's solution? Taking daily walks with Core, where he will subtly implant the answers into their conversation. So it's days like these that I curse the Chinese for inventing gunpowder. And believe it or not, it actually worked. Cora and Trisha did astoundingly well at trivia that night. They even win the whole thing. And out of all the lies that Nathan tells during the episode, this is probably the worst one because not only is he tricking Cor into learning the trivia answers, but he's cheating out every other trivia team by knowing the answers in advance. And since this lie has consequences on people outside the subjects of the episode, I would say that this is probably his worst offense the entire episode. But even so, I don't think this one really compares to the other two worst lies told, which are by none other than Cor himself. I give this one four out of five liars. Sorry to stop the video, but let's take a second to talk about our sponsor for today's video, Casetify. People always come up to me on the streets and they say, Nick, I'm having an issue here. I have no way to publicly show my interests in the form of a phone case. And I say, whoa, that's so crazy. What are the chances? I actually was sponsored by Casetify, so I have a, a great solution for you. It's crazy how things work out like that. I've partnered with one of my favorite artists, Day Off Limited, to create a Nick is not green Casetify case. With three awesome colorways, this this case is everything you need for people to think that you're cool and awesome. Casetify's new impact and ultra impact cases are made of 65% recyclable and plant-based material, so you know your phone case is coming from a good and sustainable place. Their Chitech 2.0 technology also offers drop protection from up to 9.8 feet, and I'll prove it right now. In case Defy's cases never once let me down. They also have an endless amount of curated print options so you can pick a design that works perfectly for you if the Nick is not green case somehow doesn't suit your needs. You can even personalize a case of your own like I did with these cases that say stinky and barf on them. And finally, their cases feature Defensify, which is an antimicrobial coating that kills 99% of bacteria. These cases are the perfect gift for any friend or family member who's having a birthday or a Christmas or a bar mitzvah. So show them who's boss, get a freaking case. If you wanna look cool, just like me and have a Nick is not green case or any other case for that matter, go to casetify.com slash Nick is not green to get 15% off your order. Then get a case to for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to the fun. Okay, so next up, on the night of the confrontation, Cor's first task when arriving at the bar is securing a spot for him and Trisha. He notices, however, that there's another couple sitting in his spot. This is the spot that Nathan and Cor rehearsed the confrontation for over and over again. Now, in my world, the solution to someone taking my table is just to find another table to sit at. But we aren't in my world. We're in the beautiful, fucked up and twisted world of Nathan Fielder. So what does Core do, you ask? Well, 
he approaches the couple sitting at his table and he says this. Um, my grandmother died of like brain cancer recently. Uh, and this terrible thing. Uh, this table here is like a sentimental thing. Um, and then you're all settled here, but could, um, would you consider moving to another area? So he lied about the table being important to him and his fake dead grandmother to get a couple to move one table over. And what's worse is that the man sitting at the table confessed that he went through something similar recently, so he sympathized with them and he moved. My grandmother very recently died of something very similar, so I, I feel oh, for you. I'm so sorry about that. Now, I don't want to really pin this lie solely on core because I assume Nathan planned this during the rehearsal, but for him to approach a real life couple and actually follow through with saying something is like mind boggling to me. The absurd and unnecessary nature of this lie that could only be told on a show made by Nathan Fielder led me to give this manipulation another four out of five liars. Now, before we get to the worst lie of the episode, let's do a lightning round of all the other little lies that were sprinkled throughout this episode. Nathan builds a two scale model of core's apartment and hires an actor to play core to rehearse for their initial meeting. Nathan fills their skeet guns with blanks in order to create a bonding moment. Nathan hires an old man to interrupt them in the pool as a way to protect himself from giving away too much information. Nathan created a fake blog and hired Trisha to write a post for it, and instead of interviewing what Trisha thought was a bird watcher, she actually interviewed an actor who would study her every move and be her in the rehearsal. The actor then lies about having a daughter named Trisha to gauge her reaction when being lied to, and Nathan poses as the blogger again in order to interview the trivia host and secure the real trivia questions on camera. But what's worse than that comment, what's worse than Nathan subtly implanting trivia, worse than filling up skeet guns with blanks, worse than posing as the owner of a popular blog Thrifty Boy, is that Cora actually followed through with the rehearsal. In preparation for what is essentially an overreaction to a lie that Cora himself told, he seeks out help from a reality show to practice coming clean to Trisha. He spends weeks painting Trisha out to be a bad person certain that a confrontation with her could potentially turn violent, criticizing his friend of 20 plus years. And in the end, it hardly mattered at all. Trisha had such a mild reaction to the confession, which leads me to give this 5 out of 5 liars and conclude that... Yeah, that's right. I said it. Now, I know that he created the show, but I don't think Nathan actually did that much wrong in this episode besides the cheating at trivia thing. But putting that into context with the premise and the entire concept of the show, that's one of the tamest things that happened during that episode. And the only reason it seems so egregious is because of how against cheating at trivia Core is. Meanwhile, Core signed up for a television show and made his close friend of 20 plus years look horrible on national television, all because he was too scared to come clean about a lie that nobody really would have cared that much about. Now I'm going to cut Core some slack here because obviously we're watching him through the lens of the show and later on in that episode he reveals to Trisha that the reason for his educational insecurity is that his dad offered to pay for his schooling but he never did which is why Core felt inclined to lie about it. But still I don't think that our author at the New Yorker is giving Core enough credit for giving Nathan an absurd situation to bounce off of even if Nathan harps extra hard on that absurdity for the sake of comedy. Now, as I've addressed before, Nathan is, of course, in a position of power as the creator of the show. Now, he created these environments and he was aware of the situation he was putting Kor through, but he was pretty straightforward from the beginning that his sole mission was to help Kor flawlessly execute the confession that he wanted to make to Trisha. Now, at the beginning of the show, by revealing that he made a two-scale replica of Kor's apartment in their first meeting in order to rehearse his own meeting with Kor, Nathan set up the type of show this is right away, and Kor still agreed to go through with the experiment, knowing what was going to happen. He told this monumental lie to his friend by doing the rehearsal, and even though Trisha had to sign a release in order for us to actually see this episode, I still feel like this is a huge breach of their friendship. I mean, imagine this. You and your friend love to go on runs. In fact, your friend is so good at running that they actually competed in the Olympics. They told you this over a decade ago. Then one day, they come clean to you. They never actually competed in the Olympics. They just told you this because they were scared that you wouldn't run with them if they weren't an Olympian runner. 
Obviously, this is jarring news to hear, but you love your friend, so you forgive them and you try to move on. They look relieved that you took the news so well, but as you make it home from the run, camera operators swarm you. A socially inept man with rustic charm and salt and pepper hair emerges from the bushes, pushing papers in your face. Your friend set up a simulation where they ran with an actor they hired to look like you, accounting for every single permutation that could possibly happen. Now, after all that, let me ask you this. Would you even care at this point about the Olympian thing, or do you think you'd be more upset that your friend told an even bigger lie to you and made you look terrible on an HBO Max show that'll probably get canceled and replaced with a shitty Discovery Plus show about long haul trucking by next summer? Now, when it comes down to it, yes, Nathan Fielder is unconventional in his methods, and he obviously has an agenda or at least a creative vision when it comes to the media he's creating, but from an objective standpoint, standpoint, he seeks out people that need a problem solved, and since these people volunteer to be on television, and for the most part, they're not put in inhumane conditions, it seems like a pretty morally upstanding show. Now, the real harm comes in when people who did not agree to be on a television show, like Trisha, are manipulated and portrayed negatively on national television. So I guess by that logic, does that mean that all reality competition shows are ethical since all the contestants signed papers and agreed to be there? Well, uh... The very concept of the rehearsal hinges upon the fact that these are real people in real situations, even if the simulation is fabricated. But part of what makes other reality TV shows so enjoyable and engrossing is that the drama seems so outlandish and escapist. But a lot of this is due to producers stretching certain narratives or portraying their contestants a certain way, which can lead to some pretty nasty situations. One of Netflix's most popular reality shows, Love is Blind, is currently in the midst of a lawsuit filed by one of their own contestants from season Season two. Jeremy Hartwell, the contestant, said that upon arrival at the complex where they would be filming, the contestants were separated and isolated for over 24 hours completely alone. He said that snacks and water were so infrequent that he would have to wait hours to get a drink if he was thirsty. During filming, Jeremy said that everybody was sleep deprived and food and water were extremely difficult to access, but there was always an abundance of alcohol. He said that he was always encouraged to drink even if it was on an empty stomach. And he is now suing the show for inhumane working conditions conditions and inadequate pay. According to this Variety article, producers paid contestants a flat rate of $1,000 per week, despite forcing them to work up to 20 hours per day, seven days per week. That works out to be as little as $7.14 per hour, which is well under the $15 minimum wage in Los Angeles County. Now, the lawyers representing Jeremy said that the alcohol surplus and food scarcity was intentionally designed to put the cast in a heightened mental state to give the show better drama to work with. Now, Love is Blind isn't the only reality show that mistreats its cast members. I could probably write a doctoral dissertation about maltreatment issues with The Bachelor and its spin-off shows. I legally could but I won't. But it's a lot of the same stuff. Alcohol surpluses and food shortages to create fabricated drama rooted in the neglect of real people. There was even an instance in 2017 where production had to shut down on Bachelor in Paradise because a crew member witnessed and reported the sexual assault of one of the contestants. Now, besides romance reality TV, Abby Lee Miller faced a $5 million lawsuit from one of the moms on Dance Moms for starting fights with them. Tyra Banks was sued by an America's Next Top Model contestant for never receiving her prize money on top of failing to receive medical care for an anxiety attack she had while shooting the show. And Gordon Ramsay was even sued by one of the restaurants on Kitchen Nightmares for continuing to air an episode that did not reflect the restaurant fairly. But didn't these people sign up for this willingly? Does it even matter if a show is ethical? Now, a lot of the time it feels like people put reality TV in its own box, completely separate from scripted content when talking about its morality. The Bachelor, Real Housewives, and Dance Moms are all considered trash TV, so the physical and mental maltreatment on set doesn't seem to garner much attention and usually results in victim blaming and a lack of actual accountability on these shows. But like I mentioned before, the rehearsal is reality TV. We shouldn't hold Nathan to this different standard just because the rehearsal isn't this cookie cutter reality show show that we've all grown accustomed to. Which is why it's so baffling to me to see people mad at this show 
over some guy helping another guy cheat at trivia. And I know that that's an oversimplification of the show. I know that the rehearsal gets more dodgy as the season progresses and the lies become more complex. And we saw in real time the over calculations that can come from a skewed view of someone. Core believed that Trisha could have gotten violent with him during this interaction and the audience believed him until we were immediately shown that Trisha wasn't nearly as nasty and judgmental as Core said she was. Our expectations were subverted instantaneously and we saw the consequences of assuming the worst in someone. But a lot of other reality shows don't give their villains the same grace. Now the point I'm trying to make is that if we are going to put the rehearsal through the ringer for potentially being morally unjust, maybe we should critically analyze all unscripted content in the same way. Now this is less about saying what about isms and trying to deflect to worse shows, but more about understanding just how relatively little a show like this matters when you have massive productions shown to millions of people who are treating their contestants unjustly in front of the camera. So why not scrutinize shows that have real tangible evidence of manipulation and abuse instead of nitpicking a reality show that has no real controversy over these claims? Now the rehearsal might not be this morally perfect show that a writer from The New Yorker would approve of, but isn't that why it's so captivating? And with this season of the rehearsal wrapped up, I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about the rest of the season, and let me know if you'd potentially want me to talk about the rest of the season in an interesting way. How was that one? That one was really good, really strong. Uh, let's do it one more time. Don't forget to tell them to like and subscribe this time.